microbes and bacteria. Uh, there are Jews and Catholics. And they are there. Uh, and you have to study them and understand how they operate. And in fact, if you go at it with, uh, oh, I've, my heart goes out to uh, the poor. Uh, my heart goes out to the victims of the hurricane or the, uh, or the earthquake in Haiti. Um, and as a sociologist, I'm going to do something about that. You're probably going to not learn anything, really. Uh, you may not even do anything effective at all. And in fact, you might have the reverse consequence of screwing everything up. You know, it's now a well-told story when there are catastrophes in the world and people start sending things like blankets and uh, ham. And um, I use ham because uh, American charities have sent ham to Muslim countries. Uh, uh, blankets to tropical countries. Uh, all kinds of screw-ups like that. And we, w it is possible to send so much stuff that you glom up the airports and the shipping ports, and then the medicine can't get in. The water can't get in. So having good intentions, if you don't understand what's going on, can actually screw everything up and have an inverse uh, kind of quality. Anyway, Max Weber's big, big phrase, um, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, see if I can uh, give it to you. Max, Max, ugh, I know just what I've done this time. Max Weber's um, really big phrase is the idea that what we need is a, is a value-free social science, that that's what we uh, ought to have. And I'm going to erase this in the old-fashioned way and write it up here once again. What we need is a social science and a sociology, which is what he's talking about, which is value-free. And only if we do that and manage to do that will we uh, manage to be effective even in terms of doing good in the world. We've got to use all the tools at our disposal. And as you'll see as the semester goes on, those tools are widespread uh, or varied. Um, ethnography, where we live among the people in the way anthropologists do it. Stay with the people and do field work and watch them over long periods of time, months and months, sometimes years and years, to figure out how those people on the street corner or those people in the bank corporation or those people in the tribe in the desert, watch and see how it is that they do things or we do large-scale surveys, or not so large-scale, in which we gather up samples and try to generalize from those samples, develop information about rates of uh, x or r rates of y. And as we develop those rates, we manipulate them statistically so that we can start seeing that maybe there's a relationship where you find high rates of, 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 uh, of uh, of early deaths of children, you find high rates of, of, of poverty, uh, for example. And then we start seeing, well, maybe there is a cause and effect relationship, and we come to understand the society uh, better than we otherwise would. So we have a social science. We do for society what medicine and sewers do for human health. We protect society. Um, and we solve its problems by knowing the social body. That's the critical thing. If we didn't know about the blood supply and we just started to try to make people well, we would, and they did, screw at bodies up. And in the same way, uh, we have to understand how it is that the social body operates before we can pretend to know how to make it better or do any help that will put things in the right way. And somewhat controversially, um, just as Mills was controversial in his way, somewhat controversial, controversially, Max Weber says the way to do that is to be value free. Keep your values in the pen uh, and, and uh, let them come forward uh, in your life as a private citizen, perhaps. 
but don't be intruding in your science with your values. You get that. So we have really two contrasting figures. And now I want to give you a study that I think has a, a kind of Weberian touch, uh, which if it isn't quite value free, is more in that neighborhood. And it will contrast with other studies that we'll be taking up in this semester that are more directly inspired by Mills and have a more Millsian kind of feeling. Well, it's the study that you've read for this week. Stanley Lieberson's book, which I hold up. You have, don't have the book um, because, alas, um, the uh, supplier was out of stock. I, would, I had intended to assign the entire book to you. Instead, you have just two chapters. A Matter of Taste, um, it's called, How Names, Fashions, and Culture Change. So there are some ways in which Lieberson, right off the bat, uh, with this project, doesn't really correspond to Mills. First of all, he's studying something that most people think doesn't matter. And this is not studying war or poverty or catastrophe or famine or crime. Who cares uh, what people's names are? This is quite trivial. Uh, indeed, fashion and taste, the very title, words used in the title of the book, uh, how names, fashions, and culture change, a matter of taste. F fashion is the silliest thing of all. And we often use that, indeed, as a term of derision. You've been captured by fashion. I feel guilty. I just bought that because it was something that was fashionable. That's, that's a kind of liability if you take fashion, or if you appear even to take fashion seriously. Uh, some people do, but you have to defend that uh, because the loading is, is against it. So he chooses something that's considered trivial and that doesn't matter. Uh, and that's not really very aligned with Mill's view of the way sociologists should carry on their work. And first names, then zeroing in on those. Well, again, uh, other than the individuals who have those names, what does it matter to anybody? Well, I think this would be Lieberson's answer. In fact, uh, Lieberson writes it, so I know it's his answer. Uh, well, first of all, there's great data, and that's something that sociologists can often get, great data. We can't find out what's really going on in the world very well. Even crime data is twisted, by the way, uh, the, because some people don't report crime. We used to have a huge problem with rape, for example, that women still in many parts of the world uh, don't report it. Um, and what does it mean anyway if, if a woman is, quote, raped by her husband? Uh, maybe that's not rape at all. And in, in, in American history and in many parts of the world, it is not considered rape because it's a woman's obligation to provide sexual pleasures to her husband. So what is the, what, how much rape has there been? Uh, well, it's, it's not so straightforward. But if we look at something like first names, that we know. We know it really pretty darn well. It's public data. Um, it's, it's, it's accessible. Uh, nobody puts it up um, to cheat anybody else. If you use income tax uh, reports, for example, people are engaged in massive cheating. And so the data is kind of OK, but kind of not OK. But if somebody names their child Robert, David, or uh, Marjorie, uh, they put it on the birth certificate. And they call that person Marjorie. Uh, for the, so usually for the rest of their lives. That is pretty good stuff. It's great data. Uh, and he gathered it up, all the first names ever used in the history of the United States since the recording began um, in the late 19th uh, century. And um, there are no secrets in it. Anybody can get it. If you want to have data about the CIA and what they're up to, you're going to have a very hard time. If you want to find out how um, dope sellers operate um, in, um, uh, uh, in, in Washington Square, uh, that's going to be a little tricky as well, because they're not going to just tell you everything you want to know if you talk to them. So here again, we have a situation where we've got great data. We don't have to go in front of the human subjects committees. All universities now in the United States and in many other parts of the world have something like a human subjects committee, 
We get our data heavily, by the way, from freshmen entering in universities. And we used to be able to put them through God knows what uh, and ask them God knows what questions. And now we have to get big approvals for that, uh, much less going into public schools, for example, and observing children or interviewing them or interviewing their parents. We have to get permission. And it's very tight. And much good research is blocked because we can't get permission. Well, here, there's no issue. It's public information. Anybody can get it. He got it. You could get it. And so it's uh, easy to do. It's good science, in other words. And so we follow the dictums of good science. Uh, in, in a way, it's easy science. And that easiness is the first step to being good science. And of course, looking at the long haul, everything maybe is connected to everything else. And by looking at first names and how that process works, maybe we can learn about all kinds of things having to do with inequality, with race, with the way social change occurs in the world, the way in which conservatism works, leadership, all sorts of things that might be of large scale interest if we look at the way in which people uh, name their children. OK, so that's what he does. And what does he learn? Well, he says, yes, we can see society through this what appear to be trivial forces of first names. So for example, we can see uh, outside forces at work. And the word that um, we um, scientists uh, of the social uh, use is we say there are exogenous. Outside forces, it's a word that you'll probably run into um, over this semester. And now you'll uh, be able to greet it with a smile um, if you weren't familiar with it before. There are exogenous forces that we will, uh, that, that affect how people choose their child's names. So in some countries, like in France, for example, there was a very restricted list of what people could name their children, only about 100 names. And that's why it's Pierre, 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 uh, because in fact that's that's on the list. It's rooted in religion. It's 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 Peter. It's Saint Peter. It's an approved name. And so uh, the French were quite limited um, in a way that the Americans were not. And that's why this is also such a gorgeous w study because people think they're naming their children uh, by virtue of a name they just like. They think it's a private thing when in fact it's being socially formed. Um, it's government. In the fact th that in the United States, the government does not restrict first names, means that uh, I looked at your names, by the way, on the course list, a uh, very striking list of first names, because it, it is an amazing, extraordinarily diverse list of first names. And you would not find that diversity um, in, um, in many countries, because either government restriction restricts it, religion restricts it, um, uh, uh, or there's some other cultural barrier that has to be crossed. So a government and religion can restrict the first names that our people use or provide for an opening for a great variety. Gender, um, we take for granted, and this is something that maybe needs to be noticed much more, that boys have one set of names and girls have another set of names. Uh, it used to be that girls had one set of jobs that they would ever be eligible for, and boys had another set of jobs, which did not overlap hardly at all with what girls could do. We had occupational segregation by gender, and that was taken for granted, just like the men's rooms and women's rooms in this building. Don't you dare cross that line, or you're some kind of pervert or dyke or revolutionary. Don't be doing it. Right. <laughs> there we go. Um, and in the same way with gender, uh, there's a more mixed case with first names. Because there are boys' names, there are girls' names. But there are some names that are both boys', girls', and boys' names and girls' names. Here's the problem, though, is that once the boys, once people name their girls with a boy's name, it starts killing it as a boy's name. 
there is an asymmetry in gender and stigma. There is no, here's my summary of it, there is no such thing as a boy named Sue. Be, Sue, S-U-E. Because if you name a boy with a girl's name, that child will be stigmatized for the rest of their life. Unless they, and they've got to get a nickname or change their name. So that starts, and it's not true the other way. You can name, are, are there any girls in the room who have boys' names? Hi, what's your name? Uh, Taylor. Taylor. Hi, it could be a last name, um, and it's often a, it used to be a boy's name. Do we have any boys named Taylor? I saw another a hand go up. Mackenzie. Wow. Okay, Mackenzie, I guess, is a, is, is a boy's name. Do we have any, like, Sam? Is, do we have a Sam in the room or a... We, yes, what's your name? Sam. <laughs> okay, you see, you just ask and you get it. We've got a Sam in the room. Um, uh, do we have any boys in the room named Barbara? <laughs> see, um, uh, that's not a very contemporary name, so that's unfair. But, uh, but if, I, if, I'd have asked that name, if I'd asked that question 40 years ago, when Barbara was a very popular girl's name, I would have not found any boys who had that name. Uh, and it's because if you name a, a boy with a girl's name, you create damaged goods in a way that you don't if you do the reverse. And that starts telling us about the way stigma works in the society and the way in which masculinity and femininity work. That for males, it is critical to be distinct, distinguished from females in a way that for females, it is not so critical to be distinguished from males. And so the penalty paid for, by a masculine woman is less than the penalty paid by a feminine man. And that's then something we can take to the sociological bank, so to speak, that we learn from the, the, the uh, history of first names and how it is that that naming process works. So I've given you some examples of exogenous, exogenous uh, uh, factors that are in play that shape how people name their children. And in some cases, those are uh, fairly obvious. And in some, cases, uh, in some cases, they're not. But they're consequential. Well, now we look at the inside processes. Not the outside forces, but the inside forces. And our fancy word for the uh, inside forces is to say they are endogenous, endogenous, endogenous as opposed to exogenous. And this is the kind of thing that Mills and his approach really would have trouble getting at um, because they're always looking for those external forces that influenced what goes, what influences, what, that influences what goes on internally. But there are internal processes, internal logics that generate change, that affect things that maybe would not be um, so obvious. So when we look at first names in the United States, what we see is change. It's, that's not such rocket science, but it's interesting to document. And that's what uh, Lieberson has done, is to document that some names, not all, but most names rise and fall. There are periods of fashion, again, that are significant uh, for names like, say, Hillary. Uh, Hillary was, there's an example, it was indeed a man's name. And it became a woman's name. Um, it became both at the, about the same moment, probably, as Hillary Clinton was born. And now it's gone as a man's name. It's probably now also gone as a woman's name. Do we have any Hillary's in the room, either male or female? It'd be probably hard to come out right now, but um, 
it's, it's probably, uh, um, there probably aren't any because it's, it's probably gone. But the point is, is that names rise together uh, and then they fall together. Um, and the, the fact that they happen in these patterns starts cluing us in to the way some aspects of the social world probably work across the board. Um, say, making war. Say, um, um, making crime. At least the possibility exists that these kinds of patterns of a kind of change in what people commonly do undergoes change over time, maybe without any external forces. Perhaps it is a part of the kind of internal dynamic uh, and logic of how things, of how things work. So for example, uh, we get some um, specifics. And one of my favorites is the way he speaks about, Lieberson speaks about ethnicity and race. And that's why I chose that particular chapter to survive uh, for the course and for you all to read it. And now you've pretty much read it, and so you know how he goes about uh, analyzing these phenomena. We see that for Jews, uh, Jews uh, are very interesting to Lieberson. Uh, and uh, there are such things as Jewish first names. And during the 1920s, the first sort of large batch in the teens and 20s and 30s, the large batch of Jewish children were born in the United States based on the vast immigration into the United States of Jews from Eastern Europe and somewhat from Germany, but overwhelmingly from Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Those people started to have babies in the United States. And what they t did was they named their babies with names that they thought were Anglo in their sound. And indeed, they were Anglo names. Names like Morton and Stanley and Harvey. And what are some of the other ones? Give me some Jewish names. What? Saul. Saul is, doesn't fit my example. Uh, and so I'm really <laughs> sorry to use it, because it's a biblical name, not a, a British name. The, the point is that they're, they're Melvin. Did I say Melvin and Marvin? Melvin and Marvin are very good to use. Uh, they're very stereotypically Jewish names. With those Jewish names, the Jews could assimilate into the United States by taking on these British names. They didn't consciously, uh, you know, sitting there in labor, not sitting there, laying there in labor, uh, <laughs> saying, let's assimilate with this one. Uh, let's call him Morton. Uh, they don't do that. Uh, which is why it's more interesting than if they did do that. Because the whole point here is all of these women in labor are giving birth to Mortons and Marvins and Melvins. And they're not thinking about social change and assimilation in America and getting their children into medical school. It's instead just kind of goes with the huffing and puffing. And they think they're doing it in isolation. And in fact, they're conforming uh, in patterns, ways that we can understand. And we can see the process of assimilation among the Jews um, who were madly assimilating and successfully, as it turned out, into American society. We can see it in their naming, uh, in their naming behavior. Then what, what Lieberson can, can find, and he does find, is that after this big batch of Marvins and Melvins are born, uh, then the wasps, who you're supposed to be assimilating toward, see them, as everybody does, pretty much, as Jewish names. And then who wants to have a Jewish name if you are want to get into Princeton and Yale and Harvard, as we know from last week, the last thing in the world you want is to be named Morton or Saul uh, or Melvin. And so you start naming your children something else, like Lance uh, or um, give me another, give me a contemporary common boy's name. What? Julian. 
Okay, see, everything's changed. Uh, that, that used to be an old Jewish name. Anyway, uh, anyway, Julius was. So uh, anyway, what happens is, is that the name loses its assimilation value. And so the, the wasps stop using it. It has no assimilation value because it's a Jewish name. And the next batch of Jewish children, the next generation, their parents drop it as well because it has no assimilation value, which they think of as, I don't like it. I just don't like it. I don't know why. Uh, it's not, I'm not going to name my child uh, with that kind of Marvin, Melvin, Mervin, uh, whatever name. Uh, and so the name is ended uh, for even the Jews. And by the way, one place where it then picks up is among African Americans who are assimilating. And so we get uh, Marvin Gaye and Melvin, there's a famous black Melvin entertainer. No? I'm not getting it from the audience. OK. Anyway, um, I have some black friends named Melvin. Just take it from me. Uh, which is, of course, not what you should be doing. You should want to see it um, in Lieberson's study. And Lieberson does bring it up. So more black children now start having, it's like the last stop of Melvin uh, is, uh, and Marvin is, is now among assimilating African-American males. And that goes on until it disappears from them as well. And we see other kinds of ethnicities uh, at work um, in these names. And th they're, they're not just ethnic names, but they tell us something about the way ethnicity is operating. So with African Americans, beginning with the Civil Rights Movement, with Martin Luther King, with Black Power, with the um, assertion of the dignity of, of the African American culture uh, and the roots of African Americans in Africa itself, we start seeing African names among African Americans. And this then is a move away from the names that were used in the plantation south, which dominated the first choice names of African Americans beginning in, in slavery, and which then persisted as traditions um, within the African American community. Anglo names. Uh, that were specific or tended toward the names of the U.S. South, those names, Leroy being uh, one of the classics, those names start to be dropped. And people take up African names or African-sounding names. And then we get the patterning of Denisha and Letitia and other Isha sounds, just like prior, as you'll read, there was a patterning among uh, white Americans and among I think across ethnicities, uh, at a certain point, there was the Lynn sound, as in Marilyn Monroe. But Marilyn and Llewellyn and Carolyn and Sue Ellen, these names uh, followed a pattern of inventiveness, but always around this common thread of the I-N-E, Y-N-E uh, kind of construction. And now we see it, uh, or maybe we don't anymore. I haven't looked at any new numbers. Uh, we did see it uh, with the rise of the civil rights movement among the African American community, in which these new kinds of names started to be um, used. And what that signals, this is why it's, it's important um, and not trivial, what that signals is a difference between African Americans and other Americans, and a self-awareness um, and a move that is not oriented simply toward assimilation, but a move that is oriented toward a kind of collective, distinctive orientation to the world. And again, it isn't necessarily the case, and I wouldn't even think it, that at the moment of labor, the mother is thinking this child is going to be distinctively African American. That mother likes the name, likes that sound, and is maybe or maybe not aware of the fact that they are part of a larger collective movement. The point is, is that they are, and we are able to see it. And we're able to see that collective movement 
that then has consequences not just in terms of names, but in many, many other spheres, including politics, for example, and social movements, and the civil rights movement uh, that, um, in which it was born into, quite literally, uh, and which it would help perpetuate um, and um, continue on. It also continues on as a way of signaling difference between African Americans and other Americans because of the name. Um, and it's what the, the Jews had as well, but which they ran from. Uh, the African Americans, in fact, self-created it. Well, there are other details that um, we can study and that we can see. Hispanics are a kind of middle case, where Hispanics who assimilate into, into America are, um, um, have variations on names that would be used in, say, Mexico, uh, but which move toward uh, the, um, uh, the, the waspy uh, American names that are in play. And in Asian Americans, we see it really strong, the assimilation modality. So Asian Americans uh, do not play with um, Chinese names they, or Japanese names. They go right for the WASP American name. Now, sometimes they keep two names, but they, uh, for, in public life, have Robert and David and, um, and, and uh, I don't know what, uh, uh, Julie uh, uh, and Samantha uh, square on. And that, of course, um, is, it, it's, I'm uncomfortable saying it's a cause or it's an effect, but it certainly goes along with the rapid assimilation of Asian Americans into the occupational structure of the United States and also uh, the residential uh, uh, structure of the United States, i.e. The, the decline of ethnic segregation between Asian Americans and high rates of intermarriage between Asian Americans uh, and other Americans. So we start, we start um, seeing uh, what that's like. OK. What we see are other logics of conformity and distinction that maybe go much beyond first names, but which are true of how we um, change the kind of medical um, attentions and procedures that we have in the United States, the kind of diets that people eat, the kind of sports that they engage in, the um, uh, the, the kind of financial instruments that they believe in, that they come to be, that people invest in, uh, the kind of political movements that they join, that are available, that become popular. All of these things maybe are subject also to exogenous and endogenous forces. And that people, as they make their choices, are not aware fully of the degree to which they are participating in collective, in collective enterprises, and some of which have their own internal, internal logic. So here's an ex another example, which I can't remember if it's in the chapter that you're reading or, or one of the other chapters, but it's very, very fascinating to me. There are people who are, let's call them leaders, leaders. Let's call them in innovators. Let's call them first movers. Let's call them uh, first adopters. Uh, in this world of changing everything, there are some people who take the first step. We're going to be talking about that phenomenon later in the course uh, as, it, as it comes up in, 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 in another way. But, th but there are distributions. There are differences among people in the degree to which they do that. And there are differences in subgroups in the way in which they do that. I've talked a little about that already today. Well, suppose you want to be the first person um, that you want an unusual name for your child. Um, and so, who has an unusual name for a child? Does anybody in the room want to come out as something? Yes. Eleanor. Well, you know, Eleanor, let's talk about your name. Uh, Eleanor, at, and you can look it up. Uh, by the way, all these first names used to be available on the web. The distribution of all the names over history, the very data that Lieberson used, he had to do his study painstakingly. But since he did his study, all of that data has been moved on the web. And anybody can take a look. And if you take a look, 
you'll see that Eleanor is a very common name uh, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century uh, and into the 20th century. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, um, is perhaps our most famous Eleanor. And um, anybody else named Eleanor in the room? You have another unusual name? Cordelia. Cordelia. That's very cool, um, as is yours, Eleanor. Uh, uh, Cordelia um, is another name with, I'm just now having to imagine it, that has a similar history to Eleanor. I think Cordelia even was popular before Eleanor and died off before Eleanor died off. But it may well be that the parents of Cornelia and Eleanor here in the room are pioneers of the rebirth of those names. And as you go through the world, you will inspire other people, other women uh, and men to name their child, their children Cornelia uh, and Eleanor. Uh, and you'll be part of a movement uh, because your parents were bringing back an old name, uh, as, which is kind of like coming up with a whole new name. Uh, like to name a boy Lance, uh, which uh, was not done uh, prior to probably the 1950s or 60s uh, in the United States, to name somebody with a new name. Now, there you are. You've named your child with a new name. And then the old story, the story is told many, many times, is that the child goes to kindergarten, and you learn that you're not the only Eleanor in the room that you're a part of, in fact, a group of people. You're not the only Lance. That these forces that conspired to create a Lance um, out of a boy's name, or Sam out of a girl's name, uh, and, and make Sam a girl's name, that you're not the only one. So where's Sam in the room? Sam, do you know any other people named Sam? Yeah, see that? Um, <laughs> I, rest, I rest my case. Uh, she does know other people named Sam. Because um, whereas the first people who named their, named Sam, named their girl Sam were pioneers, the people now who named their girl Sam are not pioneers. Uh, they're just naming their girl with what is really pretty accepted now as a girl's name, which is why it came to my mind. So what used to be a daring move is now much less daring maybe even a conforming move. On the other hand, some people may be trying to conform by choosing a name that many people have used before, uh, and they don't know that it's over. So I call it the tragedy of the last Edith. Edith was a very common name uh, in the United States uh, for women, uh, for girls. Uh, and then it just began its trail into decline. Well, somebody is going to be behind that curve, and they're going to make a mistake. And they're going to name their child Edith when Edith is through. And that Edith is then going to have the stigma of going through life with a name that is not cool at all. <laughs> but that's what happens to the last Edith. So here's the problem is that you have these intersecting forces, which is that what was once a way to be distinctive instead becomes a mechanism of conformity. What was once a mechanism of conformity is now distinctive, and perhaps in a stigmatizing way. So now, if you want to create a child with a distinctive name, maybe you have the nerve and you want to show yourself courageous and bold, you will name your child Edith. But you see, you have to do something different to be distinctive than what people who were trying to be distinctive were doing 50 years ago. And the same way with conformity. What this all boils down to is a kind of constant shift. If you have change built into the system as people vary in their degree of conformity um, and in, in their because the distribution of conformity and being bold varies among populations. Let's assume that's constant. But what you must do to be distinctive or to be constant, to go with the majority, the substance keeps changing of what you need to be and what you need to be doing. 
So if, if, if it's wild and distinctive to put your money in, say, Silicon Valley stock, if everybody puts their money in Silicon Valley stock, that's just common. And it's no longer brave and bold and distinctive. And indeed, you price up those stocks. And then they're not the kind of value they were before. And now to be distinctive and bold, you must substantively do something different because everybody else did what you did, at least eventually. And so we have constant shift. If, you, if, you, um, if, you're, if it's very cool to wear nothing but black and all black all the time, uh, then you're cool. If everybody keeps following you and everybody's black, wearing black, then you've got to wear something else um, in order to be cool. And the same way to have a radical political opinion. You, you've got to shift what that might be if you want to still be radical. If everybody agrees with you, then it's no more radical. And you have to shift in order to have a distinctive view of the world. So you see how this works. There's a constant process of endogeneity in which the little motorboat of history changes for the sake of change. Change is built into the structure of the world in the same way that constancy is also built into the structure of the world because people are running around to conform as well as to run around and change. And sometimes there are different people who are doing one as opposed to the other. So now we start getting to the bottom lines, uh, which is uh, uh, the what we can learn from the study of something like first names, which seems so trivial and matters of fashion. We see that there are inside forces and outside forces operating simultaneously um, to create outcomes. And that at least gives us the hypothesis that any time we study something, any time we look at something, both exo exogenous, exogeneity and endogeneity are in play and intersecting with one another. And you can study Lieberson for how that intersection works. But take it to everything. That's the point. That's what Lieberson wants you to do. And it's also what I am trying to uh, advocate as well. And then the other lesson, which Lieberson doesn't take us to and doesn't do, is what can we do to now re-inject the sociological imagination into our agenda? Suppose now we've learned these things about first names, and we've learned how it works. We've learned that there are exogenous forces always in play and endogenous forces always in play. OK, we take that on board. We accept it. Now what? How do we change society? What is left of the idea of morality and politics? What can we actually do to change the world um, rather than simply to understand the world? How do we bring Mills back in? And uh, I don't think Lieberson gives us an answer. Uh, and, uh, but I think that maybe that's a good mission for us in the course, is to constantly be looking for both the external forces and the internal forces and the implications for social change and for solving problems that we think uh, we share. So that's it for today.